as they come in. Um, so first and foremost, I want to say a huge thank you to everyone joining us. Um, and we have a couple of little housekeeping things. If, if we could just play by these rules, I think it'll go really smoothly. Um, first, if we could just, because I know we all kind of came here to listen to Christina talk. So if we could all mute our um, microphones on the bottom left of your screen, there should be a little microphone sign that uh, if you just click that, then that'll help us hear all the amazing things Christina has to say. And um, another thing is we are going to be recording. Um, I don't think that it shows the other participants' videos, but if you guys don't want to be recorded, just make sure to close your video. Um, if you don't mind, then you can have your little smiley face in there. Um, we love to see that. But we will have these recordings available on our YouTube channel, um, both Christina's and mine. So uh, if you have friends and family who wanted to join and couldn't because of timing, uh, we'll be definitely be sending that link out to everybody soon. Um, and then the last kind of little housekeeping thing is basically the fact that um, we have a chat function. And if you guys could go ahead and look at that chat function and type in any questions you might have during the talk today, uh, that'll be super amazing because we absolutely um, want to make sure that you guys get your questions asked and we'll be monitoring that. And then at the end, we'll be able to um, answer some of those questions if we've got some time left over. Um, so make sure you utilize that chat function. Keep your microphones on mute and everybody hopefully is doing really, really well. I know it's stressful times, so thank you again for joining us today. Um, really quickly, for some context for you guys, uh, my name is Hannah, and I am the president and lead scientist at the American Shark Conservancy. I've been pretty lucky to be really good friends with Christina Zanato for quite a few years. Um, lucky happenstance uh, ended up in the Bahamas, and um, luckily we've maintained a friendship for a while, and I think we complement each other pretty well. Um, I have a scientific background and my um, organization is primarily science-based, so we have research projects going on here in South Florida. And then basically we have um, some outreach and education opportunities too. Uh, and basically I wanted to say that um, my interest and I think my um, admiration from Christi for Christina has always been the fact that she's a true explorer. And in my mind, that is the trait of a scientist. So whether or not you have a scientific degree um, or have done academic scientific training, um, Basically, I think that's where our spirits are quite the same because we're always asking questions and I formulate those into scientific questions. Uh, Christina is a naturalist, um, an explorer. She asks the questions and is always learning. So I think that's where um, we manage to get along pretty well. Um, so just if Christina, you want to take a second to introduce yourself. Okay. Um, that would be great. And like I said, if we could just make sure everybody's muted, we can definitely hear Christina and my share. I think we still have one with the microphone open. Okay. All right. I'll scan that. Um, hi, Hannah and everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Christina Zanata. I've been living for the last 26 years on the island of Grand Bahama. I came here as a younger, much younger version of myself to learn how to scuba dive. And then I ended up staying, uh, following a passion that I had for um, the sharks that I first discovered and then uh, cave diving, which came in, in the end. Uh, through the years, I grew my uh, professional level. So like Hannah said, I am not a scientist. But I am one of those people that goes in sometimes for the scientists. I spend quite a lot of time on the water, both with the sharks or in the caves. And I go into reaches where maybe scientists uh, don't go either because of lack of qualifications or lack of time or different kind of duties. And that's what we complement each other uh, very much. Uh, on a daily basis, I'm still working with sharks. I'm still working in cave diving, uh, research, collecting data, uh, especially now after Hurricane Dorian, we've been very much concentrating on the uh, water table on the island and the consequences between the water table of the island and uh, the mangroves, the sharks, the entire fauna, the entire marine ecosystem. So something very, very interesting. I founded a People of the Water in January 2019, 
and he's a, a nonprofit. Uh, we're two members at the time, and he's uh, primarily an outreach into education and help us into furthering the exploration of what our goals are to then collect data, to then uh, be able to provide this data to people that uh, create legislations of protections, environmental um, rules for uh, specifically the island of Grand Bahama in general for the Bahamas and then to lead as an example for other locations in the world. Oh, is that all? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, again, like I said, uh, I think the main takeaway from this today I'd like everybody to have, whatever your background is, is there's a couple of different concepts out there when it comes to science. And like I said, I come from my scientific, you know, background, my training, that's, that's where our, um, I put my, that's where I invested like my interests. Um, but I think for a long time, science has sort of sat in a, like maybe a little bit of a bubble. Um, and in the past, they've swooped into areas, collected a lot of information and sort of swooped out. And that's an old school way of thinking. And I think there's a few concepts that we, as sort of the newer generation of scientists, like to um, uh, employ when we're thinking about our projects. And I think of Christina and her sharks a lot of the times when we're developing these things. And basically, the big thing is um, the idea and the concept of community or citizen science. Uh, you don't have to have four to whatever, 12, 18 years, it feels like, of training <laughs> in academia uh, to help contribute. Um, so I see that Christina's outreach and teaching all through the years has definitely been kind of training these community scientists and these citizen scientists. Um, so that's something I think we can take away from the scientific community. We can take away from um, the interactions that we have with people like Christina and the other concept as well is something we call local ecological knowledge. So we like to complicate things in science. It's basically, let's talk to the people who are actually there um, in the area that we want to study. Lots of times that has um, been used in like fish markets and dealing with fisher, fishermen and fishers and anglers. Um, they're the ones that come into contact. And now we're starting to form projects where we really talk to divers because they are the local ecological knowledge. Divers spend a ton of time in the water that I wish I could spend, um, but they do and there's this kind of hive knowledge that we're trying to tap into. And the third concept, really quickly I'll stop with the boring science stuff, but the third concept as well is participatory approach. And another fancy word, basically if you come into an area and you want to study something, like I want to know more about Christina's um, Caribbean reef sharks, and we come into an area and I want to engage her, the communities, the industries, um, basically they, if you, can, if you include them in your project design and you include them in the science and communicate with them, there's gonna be, first of all, your science is gonna be way better. Um, and secondly, you are gonna know a lot more than you would know if you just swooped in. And thirdly, once that information comes out, in these goofy scientific papers that are really long and complicated, I'm going to have such a great relationship with that group that I'm going to be able to communicate the results to them and they're going to buy into the results. And those results for our organization are very much driven by what's going to make policies better for sharks. So although science has been in a bubble, um, I think it's just really important to know that there's a lot of people working um, on including all of our amazing uh, explorers like Christina in our projects moving forward. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start asking, <laughs> firing off some questions to Christina about her area as a scientist, things that I'm interested in. Um, so hopefully you guys will uh, learn a little bit more about it as well. Um, so you kind of explained where you live and work. Um, can you explain your actual work with sharks? Like what does your day look like? So um, it depends on the day. I have a very uh, variety of jobs that I do during the day is uh, um, I know a lot of people I receive a lot of comments about oh I want to come and work with you with sharks uh, what they uh, sometimes people don't realize is that yes I work with sharks uh, but then I also so I have, you know, dry jobs and I have background jobs and I have the cave diving jobs and I try to put all of these together. So my days are very different from one day to the other. Currently, due to COVID, we're not allowed to boat for pleasure. So I haven't been able to go out with the shark specifically. 
uh, thanks to a permit that I have through the police and the Bahama National Trust, I am constantly working into the cave work and what we're doing, which then relates to the mangroves and the sharks in a secondary way, but um, has been since March 15th uh, since I've seen the sharks. When I am with the sharks, the original work that I started, it was a tourism job. So when people ask me, oh, I want to do what you do, at the end of the day, if I want to simplify my, my descriptions, never mind the titles I have and, you know, everything I do, and I could sit here and just give you all the titles of all the things I teach and all that. I am a diving professional who works in shark tourism, which is a very, very wealthy industry in the Bahamas. The Bahamian government they did a couple of very good things uh, back in 1993 for a bit long lining and then scoop net as well as drift nets. So there's quite a lot of a very invasive fishing methods that were stopped early. Uh, thanks also to the contribution of Dr. Samuel Gruber from Bimini Shark Lab, here comes the science, <laughs> that our uh, shark population was Fairly, very much left untouched. And the other, the other reason why is luckily sharks were not on the fishing nor feeding menu of the local population nor the export in the proximities, which our market for fishing is primarily the United States of America and Canada. What happens uh, with that is our shark population maintain a nice uh, healthy level and then shark tourism develop in all its form from snorkeling with the uh, nurse sharks to glass bottom boats to hand feeding like I do. And in 2015 there was a study done and it was a, a citizen science done it was all done on dive operators divers all sorts of questionnaires asking why you're here what brought you here and all that and it was discovered that there's an average of 109 billion dollars brought sorry million dollars brought into the bahamas by shark tourism alone so it's quite a lot of money so based on that and what I was doing and the fact that I wanted to protect sharks, I use simply my work, the shark tourism part, to start a campaign asking and say, hey, we need to protect these animals. I wanted to protect them because I love sharks. And because I find sharks, I can see where the sharks are and I can see how healthy the ocean is. And Hannah can tell you this, you immerse where the sharks are swimming, no matter where it is, east of Grand Bahama, west of Grand Bahama, Bimini, Cat Island, where there are sharks, with their healthy populations of sharks, the reef is booming at all levels, all the way from all the fish, all the way down to the corals and the sponges and the invertebrates. So for me, it was like a personal love. I wanted to protect sharks. But making people want to protect sharks just to protect sharks sometimes becomes a little bit harder. So one of the leverage that we had here as a community was, well, they actually bring in money. Live sharks have more economical value than dead sharks. And we had to prove that. And so we proved that. And so that's how the work went. Then personally, uh, one of the other jobs I do is, is introducing people to the sharks. Uh, through the shark dive, through the one-on-one -on -one course. People can even wear the chainmail and stand side by side with me and what, do what I call shark themselves, enter in a communication and contact with shark that from a scientific point of view maybe has no value, but from an emotional contact point of view has one of the most beautiful values I've ever seen in, in, in my life. People come up with a total concept of sharks being creatures with feelings, with uh, uh, desires, with fears, with also being vulnerable. They see down there my sharks being, you know, hurt or being damaged. And, and so it's a, mine is a people approach. And from a scientific point of view, uh, what Hannah was talking about is I call, I do what it's called dive side fidelity. So that's the reason why I never moved. Um, I picked an area and I concentrate on this area and by going in on a daily basis, both in the caves and with the sharks and on the reef, I can actually uh, see changes. I can tell you which coral head was uh, sick and died within the last two to three weeks. I can tell you how many years has this uh, mollusk been on this, on this reef. I have an anemone that I've been waving at for the last 16 years. So I have a collection of data 
that is caused by this uh, dive side fidelity, so this repetition. And that's something that I think is like, I can feel myself, like I, every time you talk about it, like I get flushed because as scientists, we're like, long-term data sets are usually what are used to prove trends and changes and you can attribute it to something good or bad happening. So in your case, a lot of your dive site, you can say you've seen healthy reefs, um, you know, invertebrate from the invertebrates to the fish. Um, and that's something that's like a positive thing. So we can attribute that to all of the different factors that are going on. Um, so a lot of the times, unfortunately, it's to monitor bad things. So here in Florida, we've seen a lot of coral reef decline. And again, that's been based on diver observations. Um, but to get your hand, what, what I think the scramble is now for conservation biologists is to get our hands on what was known 10, 20 years ago. Um, and that's where the value of someone who observes this as a naturalist, um, for lack of a better term, but somebody who has standardized their observation. So like you said, your dive site, your site fatality has been very, very consistent over time. And all of these are just little bells going, <laughs> going off for a scientist because these are the things that are super important to monitoring that stuff um, moving forward and seeing the trends and where that science comes in then, your observations can be turned a little bit into science and then all of that can get wrapped up and handed to a policymaker to say, look, this is what we've observed. So science doesn't, conservation doesn't happen in a bubble. Um, so that's why we get excited when we hear about these long-term observations. Um, so I did have a question. Um, so you're at the same, the same place all the time. And do you see the same species of sharks? Because I know we've talked about it before where if you think about if you guys have heard of other sites like Tiger Beach, et cetera, there's there's usually pretty big sharks of very different species. I mean, do you only really see one one or two different species? What's your species composition, I guess? So the species composition where I work, which is less than a mile off off the south shore of Grand Bahama on a shallow reef, it's a 45 foot, 15 meters depth, is primarily the Caribbean reef sharks and the nurse sharks. So those are constantly great. Sometimes we see a couple of the sharp nose. They're a little bit difficult to recognize just because they look very similar to the Caribbean reef sharks, but they are, we have had sharp nose. On occasion, we have been having great hammerheads and the tigers scooping by, but those are the exception to the rule. So if primarily I work with Caribbean reef sharks and nurse sharks. Now what, what they do, the population that I deal with stretches over about a two mile radius. They might stretch further. What I'm saying is I dive within a two miles radius and I see the population within that two mile radius. But usually Caribbean reef sharks are not migratory animals and they're stationary. So I actually have some, um, an advantage to other species is I can work with these sharks year round. Where Tiger Beach and the Great Hammerheads and the Oceanic White Tips here in the Bahamas have only a seasonal presence, which makes dive, dive site fidelity a little bit more difficult. And within the Caribbean reef sharks, I have a population that tends to sit uh, within the area where I do the dive. And then there is a, a branch of the population that actually doesn't even come in. And they can be less than two, three yard, hundred yards away on a different dive site, uh, but I don't see them coming into the dive. And when I see, see them or don't see them is because I physically know each and every one of the sharks. Uh, we have a collection of the entire picture of the shark uh, with the details of the dorsal fin, the pectoral fins, the tail, uh, some of the uh, blemishes that hopefully stay. Shark skin has this <laughs> crazy tendency of like healing so perfectly. Sometimes you see a blemish and thinking, oh, that's going to stay. That's really big. And you know, six months later, there's like nothing. <laughs> Uh, but we have a catalog of each animal and each shark uh, from that point of view. We also have a collection of what is called photogrammetry. Photogrammetry, it's uh, done with a remote, a little camera, a little GoPro, and the two laser beams. And you take a video with this little homemade, you have it? I have it here too. There it is. Okay, we have one. <laughs> 
we go around and basically take a video of the shark with a camera in the middle and the two laser. And then with a little chart at home, you can actually uh, measure based on the 25 centimeters uh, distance between the two program lasers. So we have like this huge catalogation of the sharks, which I use for other people. Personally, I have spent so much time in the water with them that I see them visually. I can actually recognize some of my sharks from how they swim. The same you would recognize someone's walking in a crowd. I can actually physically recognize that has they swim from a different distance. I haven't even seen yet any of the characteristics and I know that's, you know, could be Stumpy or Grandma. And so we have these two different populations. One comes and interacts with the humans. The other one kind of like stays off. What I've noticed, the one that stays off tends to come in into the interaction. And maybe Hannah had questions later, but I'll bring it in. When I remove hooks, so what I notice is these sharks that don't come and interact, when they're damaged with hooks, they actually come into the dive site and tend to come into the interaction when they only present hooks and then disappear again. So they're so not that, part of your regular crew. The advantage that I have to have in this relationship with Hannah and science is I may see something because I'm there, I'm there day in, day out. And maybe there is a paper out there somewhere, somehow, but sometimes I don't know. But I give you an example. Do you remember two summers ago, um, I noticed basically through a diary that I keep, I know which shark has had mating season through the bite marks that the, their bodies present. So they get pretty big gashes and a lot of bruises and kind of like, it looks violent, but that's how sharks mate. And so I know those are females had a mating encounter. And then obviously by this time of year, I can tell when the sharks are pregnant, they do present a traditional round up belly that extend from after the gills, after the pectoral fins, all the way down to the tail. So you can really start seeing their belly rounding up. So I write down, oh, grandma this year is pregnant. Oh, grandma last year did mate. And I remember there was one season, um, we verified the Caribbean reef sharks, they either mate or give birth. So if in July of the summer, uh, Steph, who is now pregnant, will give birth, she will not produce uh, any of the uh, pheromones to attract the males, or so we thought, right? They usually don't mate. But then I had a couple of females uh, through the years that actually were pregnant, gave birth a couple of weeks ahead of what is the schedule and then two weeks later showed up with bite marks a typical of the mating but they never became pregnant so, so this is a kind of information and then i'll be all excited and text hannah and then <laughs> hannah with her science background can either find that this has already been verified or actually decide that this is something that we can actually look into and try to study yeah and those are Definitely this, the, um, I think we've, especially with sharks, look, there's a lot of work to be done, um, 500 plus species, and we know very little about the life history um, of a lot of those species, and, and of the ones that we do know, uh, it's based on, you know, kind of patchy information. There hasn't been um, a huge, the, the lemon shark is one of the best studied sharks. Um, the Bimini Shark Lab, like you said, Dr. Gruber and his whole amazing crew um, have really like gotten into the fine details, but that's one lab working with one species. You really don't find that fine scale kind of understanding. And again, it's based on observations of somebody who's able to be in the water and it's obviously really valuable so that's been really interesting to hear the comments and we work with divers here in the floor in florida as well as they know they you know as they make observations we've seen changes in skin pattern and colors and um you know different mating seasons that are different than the published information so science isn't like okay we write the paper we know what we're talking about every caribbean reef shark gets pregnant in july um it's about always asking and verifying and asking again um so again that's why these relationships are are really um important so um you had mentioned that you haven't been in the water since sometime in march um has that ever happened before have there been long stretches when you haven't been able to get back in the water oh yes they're called hurricanes or <laughs> uh, the worst stretch has been now after Dorian. 
Uh, I went in the water three weeks after Dorian uh, just to do a, a dive. Uh, visibility maybe was uh, 20 feet at the time. I mean, the suspended particles were pre pretty much atrocious. You still have to think we were still an island without running water and, and, and power. So it was actually pretty good to be able to motor up a boat and hand out into the ocean and have a visit. And the sharks were uh, there. I saw about uh, six or seven of them, but then it took about two and a half months to be able to go back and actually establish again, say, hey, you know, here I am, I'm back. Um, and this has happened after Hurricane Matthew, as well as Hurricane uh, Francis and Jeannie back in 2004. Now I'm really dating myself. And then after uh, Sandy in 2012. So any major storm that's hit the island has elongated the stretch of the time I spent in the water. Same as uh, I remember, you know, once I went around for a month backpacking through India. So I was a month out of the water uh, with the sharks. But at the time, there might be other feeders doing, doing the work. So like complete absence of humans has been, um, it says my connection is a little bit unstable. I hope everybody can see him. My complete absence of fusion after major storms and now after COVID. Uh, what we've noticed is that the sharks go on with their day-to-day -day life. Um, they don't seem to be affected in any shape or form. None of them look like Amanchiri. None of them was missing. None of them was damaged by any of these hurricanes of through the years. Uh, there are thoughts that during the storms, the sharks tend to go deeper. One of the observations I've done, um, and Hannah asked me earlier on, so how much time I spend in the water with sharks? If I am in a day dedicated to the sharks, I can be in the water about four to five hours, depending on the day. And although it sounds quite a lot, it's actually less than what each and every one of us might spend in an office in a day or talking to their colleagues. But from a, um, being in a water point of view, it's quite a lot of time. But one of the things I notice is, for example, when the hurricanes come is the sharks, the Caribbean sharks, the one I'm working with, uh, tend to become a little bit edgy. And about three to four days prior to the storm having to hit, uh, the island, because obviously it's very well forecasted, uh, the sharks go into this uh, provisioning mode. So uh, they seem to be very much affected by weather patterns, and especially with the hurricane, their intensity of wanting to provision escalates to the point that I've come up with the rules. If there is a hurricane heading for this island four to five days prior to the hurricane, there's no more food interaction work with the sharks. Really? That's yeah. it. So they, are they just like hyped up? Is there they behavior? look like people going buying toilet paper for COVID-19. <laughs> That's the worst. <laughs> so they have that kind of like frantic uh, behavior, uh, high energy intensity, which uh, according to the rules that I follow for me to work with sharks, obviously uh, for the safety of the people and, and the sharks themselves, we interrupt any of these uh, direct food related interactions. We might still go scuba diving, but usually about three to four days before the hurricane is prep anytime. Anyway, you, you know that you're in Florida. So but it's become very much like something that I notice, and um, they, they go into provisioning mode. It seems like yes. they feel, I try to imagine these animals with eight senses, right? Uh, feeling this barometric pressure decline and we feel it outside the difference in the air we breathe and how the birds get quiet and how our blood pressure changes as the hurricane comes close and siphons all the weather away and just puts up this cape. I tried to imagine these animals with eight senses being affected by the pressure of the water as well. So yeah. very much another observation that I collected through the years that makes me come and up with certain rules about interacting with the animals. That's, I mean, based on safety, that seems like a really good call. <laughs> um, and then after, after a hurricane, so you get back in the water, does it take a while for them to come in a little closer? Do you think they've like moved off the area a little bit and want to, or do you think they're, is it kind of no. just business as normal? They, they stay, um, primarily they stay. I never had to uh, wait. Um, and they come in as if anything nothing has happened, especially the older ones, the older ladies, the one that have been working for 10, 12 years, they usually come back in in a certain way, almost like imagine them tapping their fence and saying, where have you been? Yeah. Um, what I notice is they are not affected by our absence, which for me is a fundamental that they're not affected by our absence. 
Um, and one of the reasons why these Caribbean reef sharks are, um, although they are listed as apex predators by the scientists, it's an apex predator uh, slash cleaner. So they're usually a shark that will show up with dead, dying, decaying kind of, kind of fish. It is the shark, one of the most pestiferous sharks they have if you were to be a spear fisherman. Uh, you, you can swim around with a spear for however long you want and there's no sharks ever. And the moment you hit the spear, they're just right there. So they've been following you all along is one of the ones that causes, you know, the most uh, troubles for spear fishermen. Chances are if there's a Caribbean ray shark in the area, the fish will not make it intact up to the surface. So it is yes. primarily a cleaner, uh, although it is an apex hunter. So. Yeah, so I think the term apex is um, probably not what a lot of people think. It doesn't, you know, always mean that it's at the very top and that's all it does. Um, so I think that's another thing that like with our like education and outreach and talking about the science is kind of explaining that because I think a lot of people are usually really shocked to hear that you know, great whites are apex, but obviously they do have predators. Um, if you guys are following anything in South Africa, we, there's a pair of um, killer whales down there that are causing a little bit of trouble. Um, but also that smaller sharks are prey uh, for, for larger sharks. So it's, or, or young sharks are prey for older sharks. So it is one of those like kind of key words that um, don't always mean exactly, exactly what um, people think it means. Um, so you had mentioned to your ladies. So is do you see a difference between male and female in the presence around your dive site? Yes, uh, they tend to be primarily females. Um, from what I've observed, also the females tend to be bigger in size and tend to grow bigger than the males. Mm -hmm. Where uh, the nurse sharks, for example, I have primarily males. So the Caribbean reef sharks are primarily females and the nurse sharks I have primarily males. I have uh, two females and uh, four males nurse sharks where I have uh, two to three males and then the rest about 20 to 22 females of four Caribbean reef sharks. Their size also dictates their hierarchy. That is undisputed. The bigger girls will come in and the rest of the sharks will kind of like part a little bit away. I also watch some of the bigger girls like Stumpy or Grandma uh, discipline some of the sharks. So they'll come through and give it like a little, they'll, they'll, they're not going to bite it, but they'll just uh, snap their jaws and turn their head and <laughs> make the little, you know, four or five footer shark kind of like scuttle away. It's kind of like, not your place. It's a little bit of a uh, let's say quote unquote bully. I really don't like to give human connotations to sharks, but you can really tell it's like, no, no, this is, I'm coming in, you move. When you grow up, then maybe you can come in in the same way that I'm coming in. So there's definitely a hierarchy as well. Uh, one of the things I notice is with the males is they tend to be males that have problems. So I never had a full healthy male, like the females are showing up on the dive. Uh, my males that have showed up had like a severe bodily injuries, uh, primarily caused by human interaction. Uh, scrunchies, one of them, he had a giant hole in the head caused by a fisherman gaff. Um, Mad eye had like a, a, a object intrusion inside his a throat, and some of the males that are showing up now. They usually present hooks, and it's really interesting. It seems also that the females tend to welcome them only in that kind of situation. Once they're in, then the male stays. Some of them stay. But otherwise, I never had like a fully healthy male just showing up. But with those injuries and stuff, I'm sure you've been able to see their recovery rate too. I mean, I know it, that's definitely been like, it's been reported in the science over time, but I'm sure you've seen quite a few um, injuries yeah. recover pretty, pretty quick and see what that rate is. Some, some are, are pretty impressive. Some, unfortunately, um, will, they also didn't recover. And I think this is one of the things people need to hear, that uh, sharks are not, uh, you know, like invincible. They actually do not recover uh, sometimes from some of the injuries, especially that as humans, we inflict on them. Um, the most amazing ones are the injuries caused, for example, by small things, small objects. That could be a hook or a wire. Um, I had grandma with a wire that was coming out through her gill slits 
and the hook was invisible. And I knew the hook was suddenly or lingering inside the gill slits. And obviously I can't just pull the wire because I'm afraid the gill slit, the, the hook is going to get stuck in her gill slit. And this wire was rubbing on her side. And so from behind her gill all the way almost to her abdomen, she had a persistent um, infection. When you see it down there, and that is one of the problems, it looks green. But when you take a picture with, with a color camera that brings the color, her entire side was scraped raw. And it was this wire that kept rubbing against her side. And it went on for two or three months. And we were really worried because an infection like that can enter within the blood system of the animal. So finally, one day she was relaxed in my lap and the hook had moved enough and I was able to remove it. Her skin healed, healed within less than two weeks completely gone. Same as the made in season bite marks. They have bite marks as deep as my fingers, right? Inside. If you and I were had those kind of bite marks, we will be in the ICU. Right. And these sharks swim around and then they heal. So anything that is something natural like that, they're okay. The one that they don't recover from are primarily, uh, some of the worst ones is uh, unfortunately propeller cut. So if they lose a, a vital part of their tail or something like that, I haven't, I've seen a couple actually uh, not uh, recovering, but in general, their recovery rate is really, really high. Uh, the best one that I have is a story, which is the most recent. It was the shark that had a wire wrapped around her dorsal fin. So the entire dorsal fin was wrapped and this part of the dorsal fin was cut. So it was like dangling like this. And so an instructor and myself, Jan and I, uh, cut the wire and then the dorsal fin stay like this with these little things basically flopping in the water. And we were afraid that it would continue to break here at the bottom of the dorsal fin. Uh, but right before we actually left, what we actually realized is that the fin had healed here and left this as an appendix as in a dead appendix and it was basically melting away as the fin itself had healed and it was just a little appendix I expect to go back and have this appendix fallen off yeah. so instead of the injury continuing along the dorsal fin it actually self-healed there's yeah there's um that when I worked in South Africa there was a great white that they think the propeller hit the dorsal fin so as the dorsal fin would be you know the shark swimming that way it basically sliced it into about four pieces, almost right down to the base. Um, and within a couple of months, they just started to see little healing spots right at the base and just started to heal together. And several years later, they had this, a picture of the same shark where you could see it was lighter skin, um, but it had healed basically the entire, the entire dorsal fin. But you do make a good point that it's, they're not invincible for sure. Um, have you, I mean, I'm, I'm sure over the time you've been there, but have you noticed that you have lost yes. um, some sharks? So, and, and that is one of the issues, one of the heartbreaking part of my job is I don't have any closure. So, uh, Foggy Eye was one of my favorite, and Foggy Eye was a big girl. She was a uh, two meter ten. she was over to eight feet, and uh, a fairly big one like her her width her plumpness was really really nice and then one day she developed uh, a, a broccoli uh, kind of like a growth underneath the base of a dorsal fin so if this is dorsal fin this is her head right here she had a little tiny little broccoli when i when i touched her when i poked it it felt a little bit hard to the touch and then this broccoli grew to the size almost of like my fest within one year and she lost almost half her weight and then slowly started going up her dorsal fin um, and no matter how much I, I fed her, she, she never recovered uh, her weight. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> she's been gone now a year and a half. And I think she is, she died and she perished under cancer. And then we had another one. Her name was Isoshilis. I call it Isoshilis because her chin was a little bit, instead of being like nice and flat, she had a little bit of a triangle shape under her chin. So like the triangle is Isoshilis. And, uh, unfortunately uh, propeller cut the bottom lobe of her tail so caribbean reef sharks have a very nice developed bottom and upper lobe and the bottom lobe disappeared and she showed up on the dive a few times but then she is gone as well and she used to be a repetitive shark so, so uh, definitely some of these um, animals do disappear like i said unfortunately i don't have any closure but for an animal that's been there 10 years to disappear after start showing this kind of weaknesses i can only assume 
uh, they perished. Well, and there's, I mean, observation and, and using some of the tools that we have as scientists as well. Um, one of the really um, most used ones now are tagging with satellite tags or acoustic tags, which are little tags that basically have an individual um, frequency for each shark. Each tag gets attached to one shark, so that shark has its own little tune. And then there are listening stations all up and down the East Coast and all throughout the Bahamas as well. And that's a hard thing for us as well. So we've caught and tagged a bunch of sharks. Um, we've measured them. We've taken a ton of data. We've collected everything we can and we send them on their way. And if you get those receivers back, those listening stations back, um, and you don't hear from this particular shark, it's a really big question mark. Um, we obviously don't spend as much time with each individual as you do, uh, but it is still that sort of open-ended, or if it pings in North Carolina and then maybe in the Bahamas and then you don't hear from it again, like it's a really, it's, it's hard to find out and, and kind of come to terms with what that shark story was. So it's, it's very similar, although, like I said, we don't spend quite as much time with each individual. Um, but it kind of, as well to me, speaks to the fact that, like, we still know, there's still big gaps in what we know about um, these sharks' lives, uh, for sure. So um, as we're talking, I've seen some really great questions crop up. If, you, if you're okay with me hitting some of those for now, we've got... Hmm. Um, regarding the removal of hooks from sharks, how do you think the newer sharks knew to make their way to you for help? Do you think that was something that they, you know, is there some communication amongst the sharks? Like, how did they figure out, like, maybe I can get some help over here? That is a question that we don't have an answer and is the, the I think, I'm, one of the uh, most fascinating part of our sharks is that um, that connections that we can also make us as humans to them is when I start removing sh hooks from my sharks. So about the hooks, I don't remove hooks from all the sharks in the world. I don't go around trying to remove hooks from sharks I don't know. Primarily, I tend to remove hooks from my sharks and the sharks that show up on the dive. So I may have removed five or six hooks from the Shane shark. Um, but what happens is as I, on the dive, I specifically start addressing, removing hooks. And when I say addressing is I change the way I interact with the animals in order to remove hooks. And I know a lot of people ask me to come here and help me remove hooks is a totally different game. Um, it is a, I have to excite the animals. I have to put them in a different mind state. It becomes uh, sometimes a brace for impact kind of behavior. And I really have to go in. I try, I know people have sent me all sorts of pliers when I basically go in, it's the hands. This is what I use to remove hooks. That's the only thing, the only tool. So uh, removing a hook is not just, oh, I'm gonna put the shark and I'm gonna gently pull this. It's very much a different interactive level. So when I hyped up the interactive level to then remove the hooks, as I start removing hooks, then new sharks start appearing in the outer skirts of what is the interactive place. And they might not come in on that first dive, but if I go down the next day and I start removing hooks again, they might show up again. And then it starts, I call it the dance, right? I have to start convincing them to come in and to trust this giant thing blowing all these bubbles, you know, emitting all these weird noises and vibrations that obviously were scary to them and need to trust me, need to trust the concept that the, the fish that I'm handing out will not hurt like the last one that they actually ate because I'm pretty sure they have a connection between the two. And then comes the trying to remove the hook the shark swims away because it hurts, then it comes back. The amazing part is they keep coming back. They just allow me to work. So yes, they do have somewhat, somehow a communication. Can I prove it? No, absolutely not. But uh, can I show it by saying, you know, this is what happens every time? That's the way. And, and listening to you talk about it too, my brain kind of goes just off the cuff, but you know, you talk about um, hormones, so a lot of communication in fish happens with hormones. Um, so if there's a stress hormone being released into the water, um, their muscle twitch is different, that vibration gets sent out into the water. Um, I think there's a lot of communication. And I think we think like, oh, they pick up the phone and say like, hey, this chick's really nice. Um, but there's a lot of communication that goes on. And when there's a relief, we see it here in Florida, um, 
the sharks that get the hooks removed often when it's done correctly uh, and doesn't traumatize the shark, the shark is actually even more relaxed and stays around in the area. Um, so these signals are being sent out. So it's definitely something you know, to have to get really creative, um, but it's something that like hearing you talk about it, you know, we can start to look at eDNA and, and lots of the tools that we have on hand to kind of start to answer that. And like, you know, if we put some listening stations that are a little bit further out of line of sight, maybe we can tell if sharks or that particular shark is coming a little bit closer, but we can't see it and assessing the situation. So there's a lot of, a lot of work we can do on that. So hopefully we'll get to an answer at some point. Um, another question, having not seen the shark since the 15th, um, oh, we, I think we kind of answered that. They're, they kind of, it's business as usual, as you mentioned. Yes. yes, I'm not worried about them. The sharks, the sharks are fine. I have years of proof that when our absence uh, does not affect them uh, physically or, you know, uh, from a growth point of view. Um, I'm actually looking forward to seeing a little bit the oceans, so some of the, um, industry of the Bahamas is export of a fishing, but also by having a lot of tourism, which we love, there's always a lot of pressure also on the fishing industry to serve all the restaurants. So honestly, I'm actually looking forward to seeing uh, the um, environment being a little bit taken a breather because what the Bahamians are fishing for their own sustainability will not really put a dent much into the uh, fish. So after Dorian, when we went back in, there was like very much a, a growth into the environment. So sharks and the fish actually are doing okay. I'm not worried about them. They're, they're fine. Chances are they will have less hooks too. Right, right. Well, that's, that's definitely a, a good point. Um, so Jill is asking, um, you have extraordinary hook removing capabilities. She's wondering if you see any seasonal trends in the number of hooks or size of hooks used um, do you think the hooks are from people like intentionally fishing for sharks or maybe it's just a shark got it by accident? Um, do you see seasonal or? I'll, I'll, I'll answer with my hooks. How about that? Okay. We like visual aids. That's good. Well, it makes it easier, right? So these, yeah. are, these are some of the hooks I've been removing. I've just been giving it away. Uh, through the years. So, so, and I'm going to pick them up and show them. So if I look into a hook this size, right, this is, uh, this is a hook for a big game fish. Uh, it could be either for the sharks. Now the sharks are protected, so you're not supposed to fish for sharks. But there's a, as many of you know, there's a huge difference between the law and the enforcement of the law. But uh, hopefully people are out there trying to fish like big animals, let's say a tuna, a marlin, or, you know, selfish or something like that. So when they see the hooks, it makes me wonder, was it that specifically for the shark? Or did they come too close to the area where the sharks are? Uh, the one that makes me know that it's unintentional are this kind of hooks. This size hooks is obviously not designed for a shark. Uh, it doesn't mean they don't create problems. So some of them have had problems with, again, they're not for the sharks, but uh, one of the issues they have is uh, maybe they become, this is a three-way hook. And so this goes into the shark's mouth and then this gets stuck into the shark gill slit, for example, and starts uh, severing the gill slit. I had one, um, that actually was the shark was small enough where this was in the mouth and this was on the almost attached to the dorsal fin. So the shark was like swimming like this and it was just kind of like could not move. Uh, so the first thing I tried to do is remove it off the fin so that at least it can just swim around with this. But obviously every time it moved, it kind of like tangled. And then there's the one that are not for the sharks, uh, but they're extremely bad for the sharks and are these ones. And the reason why is the hook in itself is attached to the mouth, but then they have this, a two pound, uh, you can't really tell the weight from this, but like, this is solid. This is like oh, nearly three pound uh, thing. So now that they have it, I would like to invite anyone to try to have a piercing and then hang a three pounds weight off their piercing and see where their ears, nose, or south of the mouth go. And so maybe it's not directly to the shark, but because of how they're designed, what it does is start dragging either through the mouth opening. If it's attached somewhere else, it starts opening like gashes or through the body. So there's all sorts of hooks. Um, the worst ones are the, from a removal point of view, and I had fishermen attacking me saying, oh, you know, you can't. This is from a removal point of view. 
is a circular hook. The circular hook uh, is different. This is called the J hook and this is a circular hook. You would think I'm a fisherman. <laughs> With an, but the circular hook, the problem goes inside the shark's mouth and then stays out. And then trying to remove this to circulate out is really, really hard. And one of the reasons is the scientifically proven, obviously, the toughness of the skin of sharks, especially females that have a tougher skin than the males. When this little barb here remains stuck into their skin is like trying to remove nail from I think like you know wood without without anything just with your bare hands and so some of it is like quite a lot of work um, so hopefully this answers your questions uh, technically they should not be targeted but there's all sorts of different hooks and I, I try to remove as many as I can no matter if you're big or small yeah and just a note about the circle hooks and I'm not I'm not arguing or anything, but I'm just saying the point of the circle hook is so that it catches on the side because the J hooks can be swallowed and gut hook a shark. So that is the argument for circle hooks. Um, but I can imagine with that extra curve, um, I work with fishermen, I work with anglers and trying to see them get that out is, I completely understand that's nearly impossible. So thank you. Uh, for giving it a try. Um, let's see, we've got another question. Oh, I'll take this one if that's okay. The viable options for remotely monitoring shark behavior. Um, I kind of touched on this, the tagging that we can do. So we attach satellite tags to hammerheads um, to determine what kind of depth they use over time. Once they're released from being caught, we use the acoustic tags, so we can 10-year tags that give off a little specific ping, um, and we can let that animal go, and all of the receivers can pick up their movements. Um, lots of people are using animal-born cameras now, cameras you can clip onto the fin that's really non-invasive, which is really nice. Um, so there's a lot of different ways. Unfortunately, most of this technology is cost a ton of money. Um, so it's very slowly starting to get to be more mainstream. Um, but because these are huge animals that cover, like Christina said, some species can cover thousands of miles. Uh, it's kind of necessary to track them that way. Um, so those are some of the technologies that we have uh, available to us now, um, which has given us really good insights into where some of these animals go. Um, so let's see, why do you think the fully healthy males may stay away? Um, maybe it's to do with the size hierarchy that you um, mentioned? I, maybe. I would say so, I don't know. I, it's just something that I've been observing. So um, when I see the interaction between males and females, the females have the higher uh, position. The bigger females have a higher position over the smaller females and definitely the females have a higher position over over the uh, the males. I've actually seen younger females even discipline in the, the small males. So, so it takes quite a lot of uh, guts. I don't know again, like uh, Hannah said, they might have when they're injured um, a different um, hormonal reactions and so that may make them be perceived uh, less intrusive, maybe more welcoming to the group, or something that the group does not feel as if it's a, a different a dominant coming in. They tend to stay separated unless it's mating season anyway. So males and females, it's not that they cruise around the reef um, together when they're not into mating season. Yeah. Whereas they're also not monogamous creatures, so, so it's like very much an instinct, instinctual uh, kind of work that sharks do. So there's no like male and female communications like we have in some other species where there are couples for life sometimes. Yeah, and if don't ever, well, I would say there's some good videos done by scientists of sharks mating, but it's quite traumatic to, <laughs> to watch if you have to actually go on to YouTube and see shark mating. It's a whole other, um, it's quite, yeah, it's quite disturbing. But it's natural, so that's good. Um, really good question from Isabel. How do you energetically or mentally prepare before interacting with the sharks? Like what goes through your head maybe on the back of the boat? Or is it just muscle memory at this point? Well, 
No, no, it's not. It's never. Uh, it can never be uh, just muscle memory that applies to my cave diving, like my rip breather or anything like that. Obviously, muscle memory makes it a little bit easier for me to do uh, 10 things, but also I prepare myself so I can prepare my student and I can watch what's happening on the boat and I can make sure everything is okay while I also prepare myself. But the uh, primary part is I make sure that everything is in place. If I wrote a full shark dive, um, development so who does what where how when what if for each and every one of the participant on the dive and i deal with uh trained people or i train people to make sure that we're all on the same page so when that in place make sure that all the tools are on board including a trauma kit there's a specifically trauma kit that i had dan making for specifically shark dives and all of that I have that first preparation. So where are my tools? Are my tools ready? And they're all lined up. So I always line up everything. I make sure that none of these things that I may forget may increase my stress level. So prepared. I then uh, methodically prepare. So take like the time. By now, yes, it is muscle memory. I can put on something. It's one of the things that everyone laughs about <laughs> within minutes. I had some of my new trainees that waited for me, you know, I was walking around in my shorts and t-shirt and I said, oh, you want to start getting ready? And she kind of like waited for me to start uh, becoming ready. I finished, you know, 15 minutes before her just because I've done this so many <laughs> times over. I've, so I've definitely really take a moment to take a breath. Was that? You I said I definitely that? witnessed it. It's quite um, impressive to see you put on a chain mail tape between your fingers all in the time it takes me to get my wetsuit on. So it's uh, it's impressive, and I can do. I... <laughs> so when uh... everything physical is ready, I take a few minutes to uh, settle mentally, and is again through like my checklist, is my regulator working, and all of that. Once I hit the water, then. Uh, the thing that kicks in is I'm just happy to be there and happy to see the sharks. But the first thing I do is I watch how the sharks react when I hit the water. Are they swimming towards me? Are they scattering away? Are they staying on the surface? And that gives me a lot of information and data on what happened prior to me being there. Uh, I know the weather affects them, the visibility affects them. So once I hit the water, as I'm swimming towards sight, I'm watching the animals and what they're doing. And within seconds of landing, I can just tell from my first approach uh, how the dive is going to be. And then I adapt to them. And is one of the things that is very important when we work with sharks is we need to understand they might have a good day or a bad day. Uh, uh, the environment may affect them. Someone has been out there before as affecting them in a way that we may not uh, perceive you know what happened but we can see like in the reactions and so we adapt to them in our interaction and we either spike it up or tone it down or relax and um one of the things i use as a as a mantra when i teach is uh, you have to be able to control the food in order to control the sharks so you can use the food to attract the sharks but you also have to be able to say mm -mm, not right now food is done come down a little bit once they come down a little bit then we resume with the interaction and all of that so yeah, and I, I, I've been in the water with a lot of different people doing a lot of different things with sharks and <laughs> they're, you know, I know that you and I, <laughs> that's for another time, um, but a lot of different, and you know, you and I can laugh and we can have our friends on the boat and be joking, but once it comes down to it, there's, um, I think some of the best divers and the best um, people who interact with sharks, there's just a kind of a calm confidence that it, it emanates and I think that's definitely picked up um, by the sharks like we even from a biological level again thinking of it scientifically your heart rates down your you know you're not giving off stress and fear hormones I mean these are all like really little details but still it builds a bigger picture of like you're in control of the situation and um, those are all kind of qualities I think makes it really really successful um, I have one more question. We're getting towards the end of the time. I do see we have a bunch of questions in here and I will put them to Christina for sure. Um, and maybe we can wrap it up with a post a little bit later. Um, so I'm sorry if I didn't get to your question. Um, oh, if you want to extend a little bit, if people are okay, I'm okay. Yeah, with I mean, if everybody, yeah, I mean, we still have got 
40 plus people on here. So if we want to keep going, we certainly can. Um, this is a good question. I, I'd love to hear the answer to this too, is um, do you ever free dive with the sharks? And if so, do you notice there's a difference in how the sharks interact um, or behave towards you? Have you seen any differences between scuba and free diving? Absolutely. It's one of the, the best ones that I actually have opposite to many other people interacting with sharks. So my sharks, my group is so used to the scuba diving physical interaction that when I free dive with them, they actually run away. So if I am dressed in my wetsuit belt and free diving fins and I go free diving with them, especially as long as I'm gliding down, the moment I'm gliding down, I can see, you know, my shark and as soon as she feels me, she's like, hey, and I think I'm going to just scoot out of here. Now, once I'm down there and I settle and I start swimming, then the sharks come back in and I'm part of the group. But as I'm gliding down without the scuba, um, I notice that they tend to run away. And here's my explanation. I am only five foot five, but my fins are three and a half feet. So now I'm at eight and a half to nine feet long silent animal so i'm not distinguished myself by blowing the bubbles which they're used to oh christina blow bubbles i mean it's a giant blowing bubble thing right and all of a sudden i'm gliding in towards them which in any animal kingdom it is a uh, confrontational behavior right i was like i'm bigger than you i'm coming towards you so what the sharks do is actually scoot away and i can see you know their tails just flickers a little bit more and they get out of my free diving range. When then I settle down at 45 feet, 50 meters, then they come back in. And they're like, oh, okay, it's you. No problem. But yes, I free dive with them and we scuba dive with them without chainmail when we don't bring food. We don't have, we don't need the chainmail. And the people that come and watch us, even when we're feeding two feet away from them, don't wear a chainmail. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've got one more question here at the bottom. Um, are there water sampling measures being taken um, or where your population or where your dive site is? Or is there any other like um, samples being taken for environmental stuff? At the Not in the ocean. Right now I'm taking water samples out of the caves to monitor uh, the salinity and what has been changing since Dorian. Um, unfortunately is one of those I wish I'd been taking uh, samples before Dorian, but it, it is human nature to only study certain things either when we need them or when they become a pest. And in this case, uh, uh, the island of Grand Bahama was uh, flooded and 70% of the island was underwater and about 30 feet of water in certain areas are flooded over the island. And a lot of the, uh, well, the island is made of limestone. So the salt water uh, went through limestone and settled through the fresh water to sit on top of the salt water. And right now at home, we still have uh, salt water. So just to give you an idea of uh, the measuring, it's called PPM, it's supposed to be under 500 for you to be able to drink your water. Uh, after the hurricane, it was over 4,500. Uh, we're now between 1,700 and 2,000 depending on the day. So what I've been doing is collecting samples in the cavern in a freshwater lens and monitor that air because that's where the intake is. And it seems to be about 300 PPM uh, better than what comes out of the tap, which I assume is has to do with transfer and all of that. But no, not on the, not out in the ocean. Another thing to add to our list. Um, so another quick question. We have the question of how do you handle it when and if you see a shark becoming aggressive or in any kind of aggressive behavior when you're down there diving? But so, uh, Aggressive, uh, I, don't, I don't think the sharks become aggressive. I call them, they become a little bit more intense. So they come in with like fours, they just come in too fast. Maybe uh, uh, there's techniques that we use in order to, to provision them. And so when they do that is I do the simple thing is basically I shut down the stimuli and the stimuli is the food. So as soon as the sharks are hyped up or there's a different a dynamics that goes on, uh, the food is the first thing that we shut down. Once you shut down the food, you just relax. Um, most of the time I just stand there. And the more I stand there, the more I do nothing, the uh, calmer they become. So it's what Hannah was saying is my output is actually what they are going to uh, receive from me. Um, Point in cases, so when people come on a shark dive, for example, there's uh, some people that now use these uh, LED new video lights. All I need is two or three people to have those video lights on for the energy of the sharks to be about 10 points higher. 
and during a shark dive, I can just look at the videographer and go, oh, this is not good. And I tell the people, you know, shut your light off. And the energy of the sharks just goes like 10 steps down. So uh, that's how I deal with them. Uh, some of them I discipline. I am, you know, like if they come up too high, I'll just basically push them down and push them out of the way. And if they come up high again, I push them down and push them out of the way. And when they come in at the right height on the right speed, I reward them. So it's not training because we're in the open ocean. It is a little bit of conditioning, right? If you come in at this speed at this height, I'll reward you. If you misbehave and are a little bit of a, a pest, then we are going to have a little bit of distancing. Right. That makes, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and then another question is with no divers in the water at the moment, do you think that sanctuaries are still being protected? Um, there's been some news that marine parks in like Southeast Asia are being plundered with no one being around. And I mean, from the information that I've been given, I mean, throughout the world where we've worked really hard to establish shark sanctuaries and marine protected areas, like you mentioned in the very beginning, enforcing that and policing that and can be really, really difficult. And especially in the middle of all of all of this and just having a dive operation, like a lot of the liveaboards aren't running. So you, you know, if someone's coming to poach in an area and they see a gigantic liveaboard with loads of technology on it, uh, they're more likely not to be poaching in that area. So you've got your rangers who may or may not be functioning right now on the in the marine parks. And then you've got, you know, your dive operations that aren't running that are also eyes on the water. So yeah. um, do, what do you think is going on in the Bahamas? Well, it is a concern. It always has been a concern. Um, it depends on the area. And I do assume that areas that are closer to monitoring, for example, you know, three quarter of a mile off the south shore of Grand Bahama, it's harder for someone to come in and poach. Uh, there are other areas where there is that, that risk. It's an unfortunate question that I can't really answer. I'm hoping that with the lockdowns and forbidden, we have a forbidden for anyone to cross our waters. So hopefully that is being enforced in some of the port of entries, obviously. Uh, it's very hard to manage. We're 470,000 square uh, kilometers, 180,000 square miles between land and ocean. So um, it's a small nation. We're 350,000 people in the entire nation. So our resources are very limited. I hope in, I have that fear. I'm afraid, you know, that people may go out there and just fish whatever they need to fish, especially with the economy declining as it is and people having issues, you know, make ends meet and we're all out of work right now. So uh, that I can only hope, obviously. I'm respecting the rules so I can go out there. Um, maybe I can try to figure it out through the Bahama National Stress if we can go out there every once in a while, but um, yeah. I think it's a concern for a lot of it people. It is a very big concern. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, and then we did uh, one of the last questions here is um, any literature or recommendations for like books um, on diving or are there books that have been written about diving with sharks that you can recommend or maybe websites or any source of information that you would There's recommend? There's a few modern books that have come out on, on diving with sharks. Um, I know Oceans Ramsey published one, and then there's, uh, I can't remember his name. Uh, we can post it later. Well, I can post it later, but the, there's not really, uh, here, here's the problem with those books, and, and this is my personal opinion, is uh, unfortunately, uh, and I've read uh, quite a few of them, is uh, the summarize the shark uh, encounter and your behavior as how to dive with sharks, how to free dive with sharks, and sharks do this and sharks do that. But the problem is there's a 520 plus species of sharks. And the way I interact and work with a, a whale shark is not the same way I should interact and work with a great white nor with a, a lantern shark, which is the size of a pen. So my, the downfall of these books, and don't get me wrong, I, 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 some of them have some, some good suggestions, is they basically give out this rule, oh, don't do this with the sharks. And it's like, oh, if it's a basking shark, uh, 
it doesn't really apply. And if it's a Caribbean reef sharks, it doesn't really apply. And it is not true that if you free dive with all the sharks, they'll accept you more than if you're on scuba. And some sharks really love rebreathers and some of them by all means, uh, including mine, brace for impact because when you go down there with a the rebreather, they'll hit you and attack you trying to get you out of their area because you're you know, an unwelcome giant animal. So if you read them and find them is you need to also think about, you know, where are you, what are you doing, which shark species. Maybe a better suggestion is to find an operator that works specifically with certain species and go through their guidance in that area. Um, a great white from Guadalupe behaves extremely different from a great white from South Africa just because of the water visibility, temperature and conditions in which they operate. In South Africa, if you have a good day, it's 20 to 30 foot visibility. In Guadalupe, it's, you know, on a normal day, it's 100 foot visibility. Their behavior, their swimming, their way you can do things with them, uh, legally or illegally, because some people get out of the cage illegally in Guadalupe, but in a certain way, it's safe. You, you would never do that with great whites in South Africa. So well, I would rather find, love to find books that are species specific or at least maybe the carcarinos together and you know some of you know the laucas together or something like that that helps a little bit more um with understanding each and every shark i don't know hannah what do you think no i agree with that it's it's something we battle with because we use a lot of our science um to or our science gets used to defend behaviors sometimes and it's kind of I find myself saying oh well, that's really like that's really species specific or location specific um, so there's always a caveat that we have to keep adding uh, to these conversations so we get caught up in that a lot and honestly I, I encourage people to do a lot of research on operators because like I've said this whole talk is the fact that there's this local knowledge and these people have been doing it for a really long time um, they're going to be and I hate to use this word I know we all kind of cringe but they're gonna be the experts um, they're gonna be the ones that are gonna know that species that kind of dive there's a difference when you're sunk down to the bottom than doing a drift dive there's gonna be a difference in the species there's gonna be difference in the seasons um, so I think it's a really great um, opportunity to reach out to the people who are actually doing this on the ground floor um, and get the direct get, get information directly um, from them and I, I think that's probably going to be the most accurate information for sure so um, well actually we are it's ticking down to 12 12 15 and all of my batteries are dying <laughs> So um, I'm going to have to go ahead and sign off. Um, I just want to say a huge thank you to everybody for joining us. Um, if you get an opportunity, please, please check out Christina's Facebook. Um, obviously, all her stuff is under Christina Zanato um, and also People of the Water, which is her nonprofit arm um, and the American Shark Conservancy please, please check it out. Um, it's a time I know that everybody's stressed out, um, but all of our, all of the stuff and resources and research we do, we do for free. So if you feel like supporting us, we would really appreciate it. Um, and uh, hopefully you can see that, that the work we're doing is, is pretty valuable. So again, thank you everyone. Please stay safe. Thank you so much for joining us. Christina, did you have a last word? Yes, I, it's the last word because I, I know a lot of messages I received uh, is uh, how do I get to work with sharks and I hope this talk has demonstrated you can work with sharks on, on 360. Uh, what I would like for especially the younger people to understand is not working with sharks, it is literally working with sharks on 360. Uh, primarily uh, you have to have some scuba background sooner or later unless you're just working specifically with one species. You want to have a scuba background, you want to have a little bit of the uh, technological background. Hannah and I were just discussing how many things we have to do. We have to be photographers, editors, Photoshop artists, Excel, Word, we have to write articles. And there's a lot of time spent behind the scenes that we have to put in in order for me to be four to five hours a day out there on the boat with the sharks there's the other eight to ten hours that i spend at home prior to i wake up at four four thirty in the morning i catch up with all the things i have to i believe it or not i still you know someone has to go grocery shopping do laundry walk <laughs> with pops clean her apartment and all of that so um 
think about growing not only vertically, but trying to also grow uh, exponentially now sideways. And remember, all these different tools will eventually come in, into place and usefulness in, in the future. And I hope this talk has inspired you. To, there's so many things that we can do out there. Yeah, that's a really great point. And that's also why I wanted to, to do this, because I, I think people need to see there's always collaborations going on. Um, and you absolutely, if you're passionate about sharks, about conservation, you absolutely don't have to be. I get it all the time. Oh, I can't help. I'm not a biologist. Um, that's or not live by the ocean. You don't have to live by the ocean to help no. sharks. No, we have some of our great volunteers are from Wisconsin and the middle of the country in the United States, et cetera. So um, yeah, the takeaway I, I really hope is you guys can see is that you can pretty much have any kind of background um, and the passion comes and you're going to learn a lot by just kind of diving straight in. So um, hopefully that's the takeaway. Um, again, please give Christina a good follow, um, American Shark Conservancy, when you get a chance as well. Uh, we really appreciate all the likes and highs and interactions we get to have, especially during this weird, weird time. So I know I'm an open book. Um, Hannah um, on Facebook, American Shark Conservancy. Me too. Everything is open. Uh, yeah, everything's open. We take tons of messages all the time. So we look forward to hearing from you. Um, we're going to go through the chat and make sure that we can get a, have a look at all the questions. Sorry, I know there's a lot going on at the time. Um, so we'll, we'll try to review that and get something out. And we'll let you know when the video is posted in case you guys wanted to share it. So if you have additional questions, just send a private message. Uh, preferably email just because my social media, they, they pile up and they keep Push, pushing down, pushing down, pushing down. So go on my website or People of the Water website and send a, a message a through email. It's easier to, for me to catch it. I try to answer everyone. Every once in a while, I miss someone. So forgive me yeah. if I do. I may get back to you, you know, two, three weeks later going, oh, sorry, I missed your message. But uh, please yeah. send a message either to Hannah or myself if you have additional questions. Perfect. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christina. I miss you. Thank Hope everyone's well.